Hey, and welcome to Renovation Church. I'm Kylie, and we are so glad that you've joined us for worship today. This season has not been easy, and I think we have all learned that we cannot do life alone. So we encourage those of you who are worshiping with us at Church at Home to consider joining us here at Church at Water Place for our in-person weekly gatherings. We would love to meet you, connect with you, get to know you, and receive the gift of your presence as we worship together. Our mission here at Renovation is to inspire, equip, multiply, and deploy transcultural communities of disciples. Simply put, we want you to join us in making Jesus known, and we want to do that as a diverse family. And as a church family, every Saturday at 9.30 a.m., we have a prayer gathering at Water Place that is also broadcast live in our Facebook group. Come join us in person or virtually as we seek the Lord together. All right, y'all, it's time to worship God through song and through the hearing of his word. So wherever you are, let's get ready to worship the Lord together. i 
Righteousness and justice The foundation of your throne The fire goes before you Consuming all your foes Who can stand before you, God? Who can stand before you, Lord? Oh,
sermon, I want to give you a few next steps. If today is your first time with us, we are so glad that you're here and we would love to get to know who you are. You can text renovation to 94000. One of our team members will respond to answer any questions that you may have and get you plugged into our community. Next, weekly corporate prayer. You already know, 9.30 a.m. Saturdays at Waterplace. Be there. Next, if you're ready to take the next step into our community here at Renovation, you've got to sign up for Growth Track. Through Growth Track, you can become a church member, discover your gifts and purpose, and join a team here at Renovation. To sign up, go to renovationchurch.com slash growth track. And if you have children with you today, we have a weekly parents resource from our Renovation Kids ministry ready for you. Let us support you in discipling your children. You can go to youtube.com slash renovation church and our renovation kids resources will be there just waiting for you. All right, so our vision at Renovation Church is to see a world awaken to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. This means we wanna see the world love Jesus and we wanna see all of us join together as his people. Pursuing this vision is made possible because of your generosity. For those of you who will be giving financially to renovation today, you can text the amount you are going to give to the number on the screen or visit renovationchurch.com slash give. Thank you. And with that, let's get on to the sermon. It is good to be with you, though. Um, again, I'm so glad you're here, particularly if you would call yourself uh, not a disciple of Jesus. Like this is you're here and you didn't walk in the doors of saying that you were a Christian. Um, one, we're pretty much always this joyful. So enjoy that. Uh, but two, we, we do count it an honor that you would entrust this hour or so with us in your spiritual journey. Like, that's not a small thing, and we don't want to treat it like a small thing. And so we're very honored that you would join us this morning. Um, the Pat, myself, some of the other passion teamers would love to meet you. We'll actually be uh, next door. There's a whole other room over there. Uh, just kind of to chop it up, say hey, answer any questions you may have, just greet you, hug you if you're into that and you're okay with that kind of breaking down of social distance, so whatever that works for you. Uh, we would just love to meet you. Uh, with that... Uh, I want to give you something that all my, my uh, charismatic brethren and sisters are going to uh, appreciate. The title of my sermon today uh, is Three Prayers for a Church at Odds with the Empire. Yes, that is, that is where we are going today. Uh, and so if you would, get your Bibles and get to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. While you turn there, um, I, I want to let you know a couple things. One, uh, this is one sermon, but it's going to take two weeks. Um, a couple, a couple reasons why. One, um, I genuinely believe less is more, right? Designer in me. Uh, but two, uh, we have a hold a deep reverence and honor for our RKM ambassadors. They're discipling our children right now. We want to make sure we honor them. And there's a lot here. And so it's going to take two weeks. And so it's going to feel very abrupt when I end because it's going to be like, well, that's enough for today. Uh, and then we're just going to kind of move on. So, uh, but if you would turn to Ephesians chapter one with me. A uh, little bit of, uh, of context for the book. The Apostle Paul, who is the writer of Ephesians, is keenly aware of the circumstances that the churches in Ephesus and really around that area find themselves. Um, they were a group of people who found themselves in one of the Roman Empire's seats of power. Okay, And the way of Jesus has put them at odds with it. And the ethics and way of life that Jesus has called them to live does not fit with the ethics and practices of the empire 
watch this, of their upbringing, right? What was normal and felt comfortable no longer feels like it has a place anymore. And so Paul, being the wonderful pastor that he is, writes into this. So we're going to start reading in verse 15. We're going to kind of read through the end of the chapter, and it starts this way. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you may grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope excuse me, he has given to those he called his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Last verse 23, and the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Man, we could go home right there, couldn't we? But we're not. So let's pray together, family. Uh, Holy Spirit. Oh. God, this this is a powerful but often uncomfortable word that the Apostle Paul has given us. Father, I pray right now that you continue to open our hearts and make us ready for this. God, you've done work here this morning already by the power of your spirit and and through worship and song. I pray that it continue right now as as we dig into the powerful, powerful words of the Apostle Paul and how they ring true for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... So, at the risk of sounding like an old man and indicting myself, I'm beginning to realize something about every generation of people. We, we seem to all think that our generation of whatever it is, that, that, that discovery, is like the first time anyone's ever seen this. And like, there's no better example of this to me than music. Like every generation thinks that their music is the best and no one's ever thought of this before. And again, I'm I'm indicting myself and I wanna give you a bit of a story of when I I began to realize just how prone I was to this. So uh, my wife and I, we try to, you know, meet our neighbors and love them. We have a bunch of teenagers that often come over to the house and just hang out and play Pokemon cards and whatever, do whatever we do. Um, And they were there over there the other day and one of the girls, we were sitting there talking and then she has this, what almost seemed like a revelation to her. She said, hey, hey, have you ever heard of alternative rock like Nirvana from the 90s? She asked a late 30s white man from Atlanta that question. As though it was this new discovery that no one had seen before. Now, at first, I have to admit, I was a bit incensed on the inside, right? But I'm like, okay, this is missional. We have to care and love for our neighbors despite the offense that they give you. Okay, fine, whatever. And so instead of getting upset, I, I swallowed that and I started to educate. Because I'm like, alternative rock from the 90s, you say? Have you heard of? And we spent the next half hour to the point that I overwhelmed her with my deep track list of this genre of music. We listened to the Chili Peppers, to Bush, we listened to Mute Math, we listened to all of it. By the t- she just left the house. And I just stayed there basking in the glory of, of this genre. Good ministry, you're absolutely right. Uh, that night as I went to bed, I, I was just, you know, satisfied with myself, knowing that deep in my soul that that the, that era of music, regardless of the genre, was in fact the greatest era of music that anyone has ever thought of in humanity. Be it R&B, be it hip hop, be it alternative rock, whatever it is, it was the greatest era that has ever happened. And then what came flooding to mind was my music theory lessons. And music theory is an oppressive art form. 
because it removes all magic. <laughs> because what I remembered was that I was suffering from basically chronological snobbery. So I want to show you something, and you're going to get upset at by the end of this. I need, you to, I need to prep your hearts for this. Go ahead and put it on the list, guys. Take a look. Bask in it. Do you want to know what's similar about all those songs? At their core, it's the exact same song. Yes, it hurt my heart, too, to say that Let's Go Crazy by Prince and 10,000 Reasons by Matt Redman was the exact same song at its core. It's called the 1564. It is a chord progression that is such a banger, apparently, <laughs> that no matter who uses it, it seems to produce a hit. Because all of those follow the exact same chord progression. Now, here's what's interesting. No, no matter what I tell you now, it doesn't change how you feel about your version of that chord progression, does it? Like, if you look statistically, if you ask someone what is the greatest music that has ever been made, oftentimes, and statistically speaking, it's whatever music came out during people's formative years. Which means that if you grew up in the 70s, either Bob or the Beatles is your jam. But if you're my five-year-old daughter, Let It Go is the greatest song that humanity has ever constructed. Now, while this is funny and, and real, this should give us a bit of insight into, into ourselves and into humanity. We all believe our generation or situation is special don't we? We all believe our generation or situation is special. Like we tend to believe that our circumstances are unique, be it the wartime generation or the revolution generation or the prosperity generation, the economic decline generation or the decline of the empire generation. We all think we are living in a unique, one-of-a-kind era. And when you take it individually, Western culture has ingrained in us that we are so unique that every desire we have has a right to be realized. Insert your preferred follow your heart meme. Like we, in, in, like we tend to believe, we've been enculturated that my story is so different than everyone else's that it must be fully expressed. And like, what, there's a lie here, because when we think about that, we think, well, that's, that's liberating, but it's not. Because the idea of being special or one of a kind is an oppressive cauldron of anxiety. Because the subtle lie behind it is that we are so unique that we are, in fact, on our own. That the, that the wisdom of the ages or the wisdom of our peers or the wisdom of the Bible or the wisdom of the previous or coming after us generations has nothing for us because we are so unique and special. And, and nowhere do I think is this more important in my mind than the church in the States today. Like for generations we have held a religiously privileged position. And if you're an Orthodox Christian, you now find yourself at odds with both ends of the ideological spectrum of the empire you grew up in. And the temptation is to believe that somehow we are so unique in that, that we are on our own to navigate this time. And the truth is this, though, that while it may have, have some, some, some different aspects to it, it may have a little bit of different sprinkling of uniqueness on it. The truth is that a host of generations of Christians before us have played this exact same song. And that means for us something really beautiful and really unique. That the prayers and promises of the Bible, and specifically the text that we have today, are more relevant to us now than they ever have been. Like the promises we see in the Bible matter more to us today, perhaps, than they ever have before. And the text we have before us today, there is a promise that I want to share with you up front that we're going to get to, we're going to dive into, but it's this, is that God has empowered his church to thrive everywhere and every way. No matter the generation, no matter the circumstance, no matter the culture we find ourselves in, 
God has empowered his church to thrive everywhere and in every way. And so we want to begin with verse 15, which is a beautiful beginning that Paul has in the first part of 16 and verse 15. He opens up by saying, ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. Like this is a beautiful and common refrain for Paul. When you read through his letters, there are only a handful of things that he is continuously praising the people of God for. Faith in God during hard times and love for his people, which should give us some insight that it's almost as though we can never really grow past loving and trusting Jesus and loving and being around his people. Yep. Like we, we can't really ever get past that. But this thankfulness sets the stage for the three prayers because these prayers aren't corrective in nature, which is saying something for the New Testament because most of the epistles are corrective. He isn't displeased with the Ephesian church. He's grateful for them. He sees a loving, beautiful community, much like ours, and wants to encourage them to continue to thrive in the hostile context they are in. And so, we begin with his first of three prayers for them. Verse 16. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you may grow in your knowledge of God. Now, there is a lot to suss out here, okay? <laughs> this is just, there's a lot there. Uh, but as we dig into it, the first thing we should look at is actually what he's praying for them to receive, okay? He is praying that they receive spiritual wisdom and insight. Some of your translations may say the spirit of uh, wisdom and revelation. Either way, it's the same prayer and the same hope. Paul believes that there is a wisdom and an insight, a revelation that does not come from human experience or understanding. It is a wisdom that must be given by the Father to his kids. It is a wisdom that we would not naturally have on our own. It is a gift. And he wants them to have this gift for a very specific purpose. It's so that they may grow in the knowledge of God, or a better way to say that would be that they may fully know what is known about God. Like the best way to think about this, I think, is the revealing that comes in a committed long-term relationship, be it a friend, a spouse, um, family members, someone that you've basically committed your life to. Like after the first few years, you pretty much know everything there is to know about the person, right? You, you kind of know who they are, what their tendencies are, this and that. But that doesn't stop the things that you know from being revealed over time in a fresh and new way. Like the more you get to know that person, what you may have known already begins to reveal itself in a more beautiful, meaningful way. My daughter, at five years old, is an incredibly witty person. I'm going to get to see that and experience that in new and fresh ways the rest of her life. And there's a gift in that. How much more the bottomless wells of revelation that is our Heavenly Father? Like how much more knowing of our Heavenly Father over the course of our lives? Like I know that his mercies are new every morning. I know that, right? But there are moments in my life when that reality breaks into my reality in a new and fresh way, and I am left in awe. It's not that I didn't know it. I've read that my whole life since I've been a Christian. I've heard it preached dozens of times. But there are moments that when I wake up some days that the mercies of God being new that day hit me in a way that was unexpected and leaves me in awe. Now, a question we should be asking then is why is this way of understanding God something that is needed for a church at odds with an empire? And now there, if I can be honest, there are like mountains of reasons for this. So let's not, I'm not saying that this is the only one by no stretch of the imagination. Uh, there are, there's a bunch of reasons that it could be, but I want to focus in on one. And it's this, that there is a spiritual attack on every church and every culture and every generation to rewrite who God is and what he is like. There is a spiritual attack on every church and every culture 
and every generation to rewrite who God is and what he is like. So let's take an example for Paul's time. Back then, it was the insistence that every deity, including Caesar, was to be honored and worshiped as equal with the distinction that Caesar was Lord above them all. Like you can have your belief, essentially, as long as it doesn't conflict with the rule of the empire. When, when that is the pervasive cultural belief, you have to change who God is to make him fit. Like you can't believe in a one true God without disrupting the fragile social order that has been built. The empire needs compliance. So many people, particularly back in Paul's day, which is where the many of the letters come from, kept trying to reimagine who Jesus and God was. Anything other than the one true God among us. They tried to make him a little G God or an angel or a divine teacher. Anything other than the Lord over all. But in our day, it's a little bit different. We've been shaped by Western individualism, so we're far more individualistic than we are corporate, which means that it's not deities, it's identities. To quote the great Dr. Tim Keller, the Roman Empire would say, you Christians are too exclusive. You threaten the social order because you won't honor all deities. The modern Western world would say, you Christians are too exclusive. You threaten the social order because you won't honor all identities. And look, I know that when a pastor says that today, particularly an Orthodox Christian one, most likely, either positively or negatively, we zone in on the rapid diversification of sexual and gender identities. And look, it's not that that's not included, but I don't think that's the greatest threat. Like, I don't think that's the most difficult thing to navigate. What I think is the most difficult to navigate is, for most people, is the political identities that they have to navigate. P partly because, like, it's just harder to nail down. Right? You, you see this everywhere. Pick a, pick a part of the political spectrum. People will be co-opting the words of Jesus and the Bible for their purposes while conveniently leaving out the ones that don't line up with their particular agenda. Like, let, hear, hear me. If Jesus fits neatly into any political, social, or cultural framework, you ain't got Jesus. Like, let's just be honest. Because there are many teachings of Jesus that we don't like and are difficult for us, and we're his church. We're his bride, and we're like, I don't like this. Like, hang on. Do you, do you think it's easy to wrestle with the idea that Jesus says, hey, do good to those who spitefully mistreat you? You think we just like that? Or, or this one, this one... Honestly, a little bit terrifies me. Hey, um, if you don't forgive those who sin against you, no matter the sin, uh, our Heavenly Father won't forgive you. I don't like that. That is not an easy pill to swallow. And we're his brothers and sisters. We're the children of God, and it's difficult. The way of Jesus is difficult. And if we are not knowing him every day, if we don't spend time knowing what can be known of him, our host culture will start to shape for us who he is and what he says. It will reimagine a Jesus that upholds their fragile social order instead of the kingdom he came to establish of love, joy, and peace. This is why I believe it's that Paul says it's spiritual wisdom and insight. He wants us to be able to keenly see the places that align with his kingdom among the lies and the arguments. Like just because there isn't a particular social, political, or whatever structure that aligns perfectly with Jesus doesn't mean we set it all on fire, yeah. right? We look for the things, discern the things that are aligning with the kingdom of God while simultaneously calling out the places that doesn't. We should be very frustrating for every organization outside of the church. They should be like, oh, the Christians are with us. We're like, over here, yeah. Over there, nah. Nah, Jesus ain't with that. We should be very frustrating for all organizations outside of, of the church 
because we don't fit with them. The only place we fit is with the people of God. The only place we fit is with Jesus. Family, we, we, we must know him more fully every day. And we cannot allow the culture of the empire to paint for us a picture of who God is. It doesn't know him and it never did. We must take the time to become intimately acquainted with the character, nature, and words of our Heavenly Father. We must intentionally know what can be known every day. If I could sum this all up in a statement, it would be know God more every day. Know God more every day. Bathe yourself in the Word every day, in worship every day. Know Him more every day. This is the first prayer that Paul prays. And then we move quickly to the second in verse 18. He says, I pray that, our, that your hearts will be flooded, I love that language, with light, so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. And what has he called them? His holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Like Much like the last prayer, this has two parts to it. There is a desired attribute that Paul is praying for us that will lead to a particular outcome. So let's start with the thing he's praying for us. The first thing he wants, this to, wants to happen for us is that he wants our hearts to be flooded with light. And so here, here's what I want to do. Like, oftentimes we use words like heart without actually defining them. And so oftentimes we just take the cultural definition of what we think heart means. And so I want to give a bit of a framework for how the Bible views the word heart. The scholar P.T. O'Brien describes in his commentary this way, and I left all the verses for you so that you can go get it later if you need it. Uh, Here, heart is employed in its customary Old Testament sense to describe the seat or center of the physical, spiritual, and mental life of a person. It denotes the center and source of both physical life and the whole inner life with its feelings or emotions, volition, which is actions, and as here, it's thinking. The heart is the source of what we feel, think, and do. Like the Bible believes that actions, thoughts, and feelings are interwoven and emanate from the same place. And this is important for us when you consider that Paul says he wants that place to be flooded with light. That every corner of our core of who we are should have the light of God overwhelm it. Again, this language specifically talks like brings up the images of a floodlight, right? It was darkness. You turn on a floodlight, darkness leaves. It's the sense that our hearts, the center of who we are, is overwhelmed by the light of God. And again, I think for clarity's sake, we should say what we mean by light. In the Bible, it is a poetic way of encapsulating the the presence, the understanding, the warmth, the love, the peace, the character and knowledge of God. It is the revealing of God on or in a particular people or person. It is the presence the warmth and knowledge of God himself filling us and and forcing out all that is not honoring to him. And, And we need that, Paul says, so that we can understand the confident hope we have. A hope that is grounded in a particular reality. And I'm I'm gonna try to hold myself together as I preach this. Um, the rea- there's a particular reality for the children of God that he talks about. It's that we are his, God's, Jesus's, holy people and his inheritance. Like, let that sit with you for a second. His holy people and his inheritance. Like, I think the question we should ask is, why would this reality bring us hope? Like, when you read about hope in the Bible, it's oftentimes talking about the conquering of Jesus, which definitely brings us hope, right? The forgiveness of sins, which definitely brings us hope. But this is a particular way that Paul is saying should give you a confident hope. It is says that your confident hope is not in Jesus directly, but in who he has made you. 
You see, this is a declaration, a statement of who we are. A statement of our identity. Your hope is in who Jesus made you. This is the core of who we are now. The core of who we used to be something else entirely. And now we're something new. It, it was most, like if you, if you really consider the impact of this. Most likely, all of us defined ourselves one way or another before we came to Christ. And most likely, it was just given to us by the culture. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. This is who you are now. You are a holy people in my inheritance. Holy, which is to say that God sees you perfect and blameless before him. An inheritance, which is to say we belong to Jesus. So we're left with the question then. Why is this important for a church at Oz the Empire to know? The empire and its many affiliates are trying to tell us what being a real Christian is like. Like we see this all throughout history under every empire. There is a spiritual attack on every Christian in every culture in every generation to rewrite who we are and what we are like. What is a real Christian in our context? Like, and you can see this, again, throughout all of history, throughout every empire. And as an example, I want to take something that's particularly traumatic for our country, the colonial and slave era. For the empire, a good Christian in that day was that if you were of European descent, you conducted yourself with superiority. And if you were of African descent, you were subservient to those of European descent. That was good Christian conduct from the empire. And to refuse to live by this sinful understanding of who we are resulted in either murder or marginalization. Whether you were a Quaker or Moravians or the great Sojourner Truth or Richard Allen, upholding a biblical view of who a Christian is and what they act like ultimately cost you. But like, let me be clear, this has always been the second play of the enemy. This has always been the second play. The first play is to try to get you to reframe who God is, and the second play is to try to get us to reframe who we are. Look all the way back in Genesis 3. What does the Satan tell Eve? Is God like that? And then he moves quickly to Genesis 3, 5. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is the play of all empires that are against the kingdom of God. They reframe God and then reframe us. My dear brothers and sisters, we must have an unshakable understanding of who we are and what we are like. And there's an interesting connection here that Paul makes. He says, this understanding gives us a confident Hope. And like, as I thought about this, as I meditated on this, it became so, so meaningful and clear to me. When I have failed to live up to who I am, when I have bought the lie of the empire about what a Christian does, what do I need to know most in the world? I need to know that I am still part of his holy people. That my failure does not have any bearing on who I am. And in those deep, sorrowful moments gives me abiding hope and joy. When I am suffering from acting in accordance with my reality, with my identity in Christ, I have refused to walk the path of the host culture set out before me, and it is costing me. What do I need to know at that moment? That I belong to Jesus as his inheritance, and he is coming for me. Which is to say, I am a part of the gift the Father gave Jesus when he endured on the cross, and as a member of God's family from all peoples of the earth. 
So we have a hope that no matter what this journey brings us, no matter what comes our way, we are his. Look, let's just, like, let's just be real, man. The journey in this world is hard. Like, like the picture that we think things are supposed to be never really existed anyway. Life is hard. The way of Jesus demands much from us. And an empire that is hostile to the way of Jesus, it requires significant sacrifice. No one wants to look at their boss and refuse work on the basis of following Jesus. No one wants their housing options to be limited based on the way of Jesus. No student wants to fail a class or a test based on the way of Jesus. No one wants to be ostracized from their family because of the way of Jesus. No one wants to be socially or physically marginalized because of Jesus. Following him requires significant sacrifice. But when these two realities are at our core, who we are as his holy people, and that he will come and claim us, that burden becomes light. What was sorrow will turn to joy. Sacrifice becomes a point of celebration. Jesus says this, take my yoke and burden upon you. For it is light and easy. That doesn't mean this life is going to be problem free. That means with Jesus, we can make it with love, joy, and peace. So if I could sum all this up, it would be have hope in who you are in Jesus. Have hope in who you are in Jesus. Look, uh, this is where we're going to stop today. There's a whole thick section after this that we don't have time to get into. But here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to pray like Paul prayed for us right now. Um, Particularly, I I want to start with those who walked in here saying that they were not yet Christians. Like you, you would not ascribe to that at all. Like... This is what is offered to you. Now, I know it's heavy, and that seems like a strange thing for a man who's trying to say, come be a part of this family to offer you. I get that. But here's the thing. What you have that you don't have outside of the faith and family of God is hope. Like an unshakable, unfailing, foundational hope in Jesus. And it can be yours today right now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray for you. Something special about my prayer for you is that you decide in this moment to take a step in your uncertainty, in your questions, into walking with the people of God as we walk after Jesus. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for your words. Be they heavy. God, I, I believe that Honesty and authenticity is the most inviting thing we can do. And so right now I pray for those who are coming to faith today with all their questions, with with all of their concerns, with all their uncertainty. I pray that you fill them with the light of God right now. Flood their hearts with it. And let them know that from this moment they can say that they are a child of God. They're part of the family from all peoples of the earth that Jesus will claim as his inheritance. And let that give them hope. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of us who are part of the people of God in the room, I want to pray for us endurance. Endurance. Um, It's hard following the Lord. There's joy, there's love, there's lightness, there's peace, but it's hard, it requires a lot. It just does. But there is a joy that can be yours. Holy Spirit, I pray right now for your kids. 
God, we feel it. No matter where we walk, no matter, no matter where we engage in our context, we feel this. I pray that you give us a boldness in you, a unshakable trust that we are yours and that you are working for our good, that we belong to the King, that when we walk and we have to make difficult decisions that I believe will happen even this week for some of us, we belong to the King. And it's better to stand with Jesus than anywhere else. Give, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We say it all the time, but it is so true. The story of God, our story, is told through the work and generosity of His people. So whether today is your first time giving or if you give regularly to renovation, Thank you for your generosity. All right, y'all, if you want more info about anything you heard today, including the sermon, you can text the word renovation to that same number, 94000. We are so grateful that you chose to join us today in worship. If you want to connect with us or need prayer for anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Be blessed, y'all. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you soon.